Several years ago, in my first visit to the Baca Valley, uh, we had the chance to visit, to visit with uh, Istahar Kassis about the ministry that she accomplishes with refugees. Uh, and I, don't, I think it was maybe the second visit um, when Istahar said to our group that she needed to build a basketball court in order for the children in this particular camp and school uh, to have something to do. And she needed $4,000 to build this basketball court. And so at that point in time, uh, Mark was sojourning in Indiana where they happened to love basketball. And so he jumped into that right away and said, I'm good for a thousand bucks. And he handed her a thousand bucks. And then, um, it was a thousand, wasn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, it was a thousand. She named it Baca Court, and I paid for it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a big B on it. <laughs> That's just a lesson in real world economics. <laughs> That's how it goes when you go to San Diego. That's <laughs> the village church also contributed a thousand bucks, oh and God. and then we went on our merry way into Syria. And less than forty-eight hours later, Istahar started sending us photographs. Forty-eight hours later, the space had been cleared and levels and the forms had been poured for the concrete. Twenty-four hours after that, the concrete had been poured. Twenty-four hours after that, the goalposts were up. And twenty-four hours after, after that, the court was striped and painted and ready to go. And I then asked Istahar to come and take over the $25 million expansion project of the Village Church, which had taken 11 years and it didn't happen. <laughs> At any rate, Isdar, it is a joy to welcome you. Riyadh, it is a joy to welcome you. They are sojourning here in the U.S. for several different reasons and we were able to bring them to be with us. So I'm going to let them tell you about their ministry. Okay, good morning. It's uh, such a joy to be here with you and, uh, and to know you uh, as well. You know, I was brought up as Presbyterian in Tripoli, Lebanon. Both of my parents were Presbyterian, but my wife was brought up as a Baptist. Her, her dad is a Baptist minister in Jordan for many years. Um, so when we got married, I tried to convince her to join the Presbyterians, but as a strong Southern Baptist, yeah. that would be not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but anyway, after 30 years of marriage, she became a Presbyterian okay. and joined the Presbyterian Church in our city. So that was just an achievement because I kept saying to her, you know, there's no difference between Baptist and Presbyterian, except that Presbyterians are educated Baptists. <laughs> So I, uh, I mean, very brief about my ministry, I work in theological education now for more than almost 20 years, globally. Uh, presently, I am uh, leading John Stott Ministries Scholarship Program. It is a program founded by John Stott to equip faculty members in seminaries, Bible schools with a PhD, and then they go back to their own country or region to contribute to the transformation of preaching, teaching, and theological education. So, so far around 400 men and women got their PhD. They are working in 90, 92 countries uh, globally. Currently, we support 86 men and women who are doing their PhD in different uh, places. Uh, even with the crisis of COVID-19, we had in one academic year, last year, 19. PhD graduate, all of them completed their PhD successfully and went back to their uh, own uh, region. I just want to say that uh, one thing maybe I appreciate about uh, uh, Outreach Foundation. Uh, I should say that uh, Outreach Foundation does not support Landham or Jobs Ministry, so there is no uh, agenda behind what I'm saying. <laughs> I really appreciate what uh, John Stott used to say. I mean, if you have been to his church, All Souls, in London, it's just next to BBC headquarters. And John Stott, who was, was, used to be a very close friend to us as a family, used to say, Christians should be BBC. And what he meant was balanced biblical Christianity. And I think 
Outreach Foundation is really a balanced biblical uh, Christian, Christian organization and it is a uh, ministry. I, at least this is what I observe from a, a, a distance. One thing that I have noticed in these years, knowing some of you and interacting with some of you, is that usually Americans, as you know, you are Americans, are very much project-oriented. They want to achieve things. They want to make things happen right away. Maybe very similar to my wife when, yes. when she did Jack back uh, court. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, I have observed, in fact, is that uh, Outreach Foundation, its approach to ministry and mission is very much people-oriented. Uh, when we got visits, visiting us, talking with SDR, uh, groups are not just interested, what are you going to do? Uh, but how are you doing? How is your family life? How are, how are your staff doing? And this is a great encouragement for us, uh, being in the Middle East uh, region, to know that people are interested in us as people, not in, just in our own projects, other projects are really uh, important. So I just want to wish you all the best as you keep on uh, serving uh, God and his kingdom. And it has been a joy spending a few hours uh, with you. Thank you so much. Jan, before, before Riyadh walks away, because he would not say this about himself, but Riyadh, the Reverend Dr. Riyadh Mohammed, who is a wonderful man, he is one of the most respected uh, theologians in the Middle East today. He publishes extensively, he writes, he preaches, he instructs. I'm gonna send around, you get one of the books that I pull off my shelf continually by him called Frustrated with God, a Syrian theologian's reflections on the book of Habakkuk. It's a wonderful, book. every time I'm going back into hard parts of the world, I pull out this little book and this is just one of the many publications. Anyway, as I said, he is Thank a you. humble man, but he is, as I said, one of the most respected theologians in the Middle East today. My only regret is we only gave him five minutes. So. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> next time, next time. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was the warm up. Uh, well, I uh, I was born in Syria uh, from a Christian family, uh, raised and grew up in Jordan. Uh, my father, as Riyadh said, was a Baptist minister for 40 years in Jordan. And uh, I am married to Riyadh, who is Lebanese, so uh, we moved to Lebanon. Um, when, I, uh, when I was at university, I was one of the top of, uh, of the students, and I got a scholarship to study in Damascus University Civil Engineering. Uh, but that wasn't really my, um, uh, my heart. That wasn't my, uh, what I want to do in my life. Since I met the Lord when I was a child, I decided that I want to give my life, my education, my talents, my home, my family, uh, everything that I, the Lord gave me, I want to give it to Him. And in the Middle East, as you know, being a woman or a girl at that time, there's um, not much, not many opportunities for us. You know, it's we have a masculine culture where men is the one who should be a pastor or who should be a teacher in the church or. So as a woman, we have just, we can only serve the Lord with the Sunday school, with the kids, with the, or sing in the church or like that. But that's, that wasn't my, I, my dream is to be much more than that. And so I start praying and I told the Lord, Lord, um, you know, you know my heart, I want to be in the ministry full time. I don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to be a medical medicine doctor because I, I can, you know. But uh, my heart is to give uh, every minute in my life to you. 
and I want to be a preacher, I want to be a teacher, I want to be in, in theology teaching, I want to be uh, to preach in the school, in this, and I want to do ministry like my dad was. I want to be in the ministry. I, my dad was a great example for us. I, I want to be like him. <clears throat> but it's impossible as a girl. So then I told the Lord, look, Lord, there is only one way to do that, is for me to marry a pastor. <laughs> if I marry a pastor, then, um, then I will have so many opportunities as a pastor's wife. Uh, I can, because I am the pastor's wife in the church, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so please arrange for that. And uh, uh, anyone who, who, who wants to marry me and become a pastor in the future and full time in the ministry, please let him propose to me in these two days, coming days. <laughs> so uh, I was praying this on 18th December 82, 1982. I can't forget the date because that day changed the whole life, my life. I was expecting someone from the church that I know who loves me, but he's studying medicine. He, he's not the one. Yeah. That he's, he's, he's cannot, he can't be the pastor in the future. So I waited. The, that was Saturday at that day. Sunday, I was waiting for someone to come, getting ready. Someone will propose to me today to get married. I was, you know, only 20 years at that time. But that was my prayer. And I was a very much, you know, in faith that the Lord is preparing somebody and he's coming in these two days. Monday was the last day and I, 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 I woke up in the morning and I told, I told I was getting ready to go to my college, university, and I told him, look, Lord, this is the last, the final day for you. <laughs> and, and please, Please send someone today, or I will be a nun. <laughs> because as a, as a nun, you know, with the Catholic Church, you can do whatever. You know, as a woman, a nun, you can preach, teach, or do whatever. So uh, then um, the Lord took it so seriously. Yeah. And uh, uh, on, when we were going to the university, Riyadh came. He was our neighbor in Damascus for four years, but he never showed me any kind of love or emotion or romance or nothing. He was studying economic at that time. So he told me, can we go for a date? I said, yes, but I didn't think that Riyadh would be the man, never. So we went to a park in Damascus and to make the story short, he told me, I am in love with you a long time ago. And I feel like we as a couple, we can make a great team in serving the Lord. Because my future, it won't be in economy. I want to be full-time in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the Lord is preparing me now. I want to go for theology study and to be in the ministry. And when I look around, I see that you are the best partner for me. I told him, yes. Uh, he said, yes. <laughs> Don't you want to think about it? Don't you want to ask your parents? Don't you want to know more about me? How money I have? Much money? Do I have house? What? Nothing, nothing. I don't want to know anything. Because this is the last chance for the Lord. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end, you know, this is the final day. He said, what? I said, I told him the story. Then at that part, we decided that we will start our mission. And actually, it started from there. Uh, we were living at that time in the street called Straight, mm -hmm. in, in, in old Damascus, and we both started our mission. And if, uh, uh, after we got married, we went to Manila. And here we're, we, we, we went to Manila to study theology, to prepare ourselves for the ministry. Riyadh got his uh, Master of Divinity from there, but I got another train, another kind of training there. We lived in a compound in a very, very, very poor area. Uh, you know, Manila, the streets are full of very, I don't know who, who went to the Philippines. So many poor people living in the streets 
and uh, live, they live out of garbage, you know, they went to the garbage and they pick food and they make their uh, houses uh, from rubbish. And so we, we were living in a very nice compound with so many missionaries, Americans and Canadians, because we got scholarship at that time by the uh, by a mission here and they were supporting us, you know, limit support, not that much, but uh, good enough to live. Anyway, the kids from that place, they used to come inside our uh, compound and look in the garbage to find a piece of bread or, you know, cans of tuna or jam and they just start to, to um, eat it. And I was really, my Timothy, my son was one year at that time. And I felt so, so, painful about about this. But here where I get trained. I told Riyadh, every Friday, we want to fast the whole day. And all the money we save on that day, we will buy them food. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, bread, not open, you know, new bread, rice, sugar, whatever we can buy with the money we save on that day because our scholarship is, was very limited. It's, it's just day by day. So we don't have extra money, but we need to give from our need. And then we pack this food and we put it, put it in the garbage. And the boys and the children come the next day and they find this loaf of bread and rice and sugar and cans of jam and tuna. So every week we used to do that. And we just felt so happy seeing them coming from the window and taking these and run away with joy and with laughter. And they were really as if they achieved, um, you know, I'm so happy. One day we were in the church on Sunday and we came back from the church and we found our compound was stolen. All the houses there were stolen. You know, the thieves, you know, when you have a poor people, crimes increase. So there was a, a, a group of young men coming to the compound. They broke the windows. They even cut the metals of the windows. And they knew this, there's American <coughs> in there and there's British in the compound. And they stole the houses. There was nobody in the compound, everyone in the church, except our house. No one touched it. No one came to it. I was surprised. Our home was the poorest home. And it's very easy to open it even with this, uh, you know, just put it in, in the door and uh, very easy to open. But no one entered, nothing was missed. And the kids that came from the street, they were dancing and laughing and with joy. They told me with the poor English they have and the, with, with the poor English I have. <laughs> They told me, we did not let them come to your house. We protected your home. That was my education. When we give the poor, we are not helping them only. We are helping ourselves. We are doing it for ourselves. And since that time, I started my whole life working with the poor people with the orphanage, with the homeless. Totally different than Riyadh. Riyadh went to the high education, taking care of education, as you know. And I took the other part of the ministry, being with the poor, going everywhere, like Jesus did. He was walking around and doing good, and doing good, and giving, and feeding, and healing, and doing that. So, to do, to, to do this uh, in Lebanon, we, we started this organization. I started this organization with a group of, my, of the leaders in Lebanon who, are, who trust me and we trust them, uh, pastors in churches and elders and lawyers. And uh, uh, we started organization called Together for the Family. And uh, one day, I was in the house and Riyadh told me, uh, there is an American friend, a lady, coming to visit us. <laughs> I said, what? 
you have a girlfriend in America? <laughs> I said, well, she's not a girlfriend. She's a friend. She's coming to visit us. I want you to, to meet her. And at that time, my son, Timothy, was living in, coming, you know, he was uh, new in Atlanta. And I needed really someone to take care of him in Atlanta. He told me she lives in Atlanta. I said, oh, okay, okay, invite her. Yeah. <laughs> and then here, Marilyn come to visit our house. That was a long time ago. And we started to uh, know Marilyn, and we became good friends. And she became the godmother of my son. Mm -hmm. And I was so relieved that she's close to Timothy, our son. And he, she always, on Thanksgiving Day, here he is with his mom, Marilyn. And she was the only one who attended his, his defense or his thesis. So we were not around, she was there. So the Lord just brought her. And she used her in our life in so many ways. And the other way of, of using her was introducing <coughs> us to, to Outreach Foundation. So here we are uh, together for, for the family in partnership with, uh, with, uh, with you. What you do with us and how we serve our Lord together. This is our mission, you can read it. It's you and us. Maybe we are part of the puzzle, only one part of the puzzle in Lebanon. But the, 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 the God's masterpiece is too big and you are part of that puzzle also. So without each other, we can't do, we can't complete the mission. This is our, uh, our mission, family counseling, vocational training, medical and dental support and education. Uh, yes, uh, providing families with training, support, of course, when, when, with the name you know, it's, uh, it's together for the family. It's everything that related to the family. Counseling the families, providing the families need with the need, educate the children, educate the teenage, educate the boys, educate the mother. The mother is the key of the family. So when we have a good mothers, we have a good families. That's why we 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 have special at, uh, programs for mothers in in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, uh, you know, when, when we started taking care of the mothers, we uh, found that so many teenage and women in the tents who are living in Lebanon are traumatized. I am sure they are traumatized. The, 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 the war and the situation they live in, in Lebanon, is not that easy. Of course they are traumatized. Everyone has different kind of trauma. So our ministry stra started with, with, uh, uh, with the trauma, with counseling. And then we moved to, uh, we, we start um, bringing these traumatized teenage girls and boys from their families in Syria and in Lebanon to a camp uh, in Lebanon and uh, uh, try to counsel them, help them to speak. To, and then, uh, because I am an artist, uh, Mark has uh, one of my paintings in his home, <laughs> uh, uh, too. So I, I uh, do the art therapy. <coughs> By the way, talking about art, uh, when we started together for the family, we had no donors at all. Uh, we were alone. So I only raised funds by selling my art. And I, I, sold, I sold over 400 pieces of my art around the world. So that's how we started making funds for together for the family. And then later, uh, people start to know about us and help us. But Art is one of the gifts that the Lord gave to me to use it for his ministry, for his glory. So that's why I never get any benefit by selling art to others. It goes to the ministry. So we teach them, we have them in groups, we, we counsel them, and it, when they go home, we follow them for the whole year. We follow them up and we see how we can, for example, if someone 
uh, like music, we we give we we pay for his music education, so he can go to a music school and learn school, uh, music, and we buy guitar for him, or we buy a piano for him, or, or so we don't stop uh, on the camp. Uh, our ministry goes follow him for if someone needs medicine, you know, needs psychiatrist. We also advise him where to go, and we pay for his or for her treatment. Of course, we have a special ministry for women, as I told you. In Syria, um, imagine that 70%, 70% of the young men in Syria, over 17, escaped from Syria. They are not, no longer living in Syria, and there is no hope of them to coming back to Syria. So imagine the mothers. How, how much pain they have. They cannot go visit them, and they cannot see them coming back, unless you know, they pay for the exemption of the army service and all this uh, procedure. So most of the women in Syria, also going through the war years, have trauma. And somehow, so many broken families now in Syria. So many couples divorced. The man, if he has trauma, the easy thing to do is get in love with somebody else. Have a, have a relationship with, a, with a, another woman. And then the woman would not do that because she, in, the, in our culture, <laughs> whatever the woman do is her fault. But whatever the man do is her fault. Yeah. So um, we have so many broken families. So we need to have a, a special um, uh, care of the women in Syria and women in Lebanon who lives in the tent also, who have problems also with masculine uh, controlling uh, and, and, and living in tent and having no support and having no jobs and having no education. So all these problems. So visiting the, the woman in the tents, uh, we saw another need. They have babies. And the babies are left with no support. But why they are having babies? Because in Islam culture and within the refugees, when the girl is 12 years, 13 years, it's time for her to get married. And because the, the girls are not getting any education, and they wanted to escape the kind of life they are living. So the easier way is to marry anyone. So any man who pay money to the parents, uh, they will give him the daughter. So, so many girls in their early years of their life between 12 to 16 got married. And the problem where is that this man who married them, he doesn't want them for the whole life. He wants them for one month, two months, three months, one year maximum, and then he wants another one. So they are left with babies, and they are very small, and they don't know how to take care of the babies. And uh, or the, the mother-in-law will, co will control, of, or they are left alone with no one. Mm -hmm. So here we have this problem. Uh, that's why we started the project of helping and supporting babies, especially the babies of these very young girls who don't know what to do. And because they are traumatized themselves and being hit or being abused or being badly uh, treated by the husband, they cannot breastfeed. So we have to do, do our best to support the babies. That's why we have this babies prog program for many years now. You know, some of these girls, our name is Estihar. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So here is uh, Marilyn. And, uh, you did a great part on, on supporting babies. Uh, you helped with this program uh, in, in a great way. And uh, I am here just to thank you, really, because you have been a great partner 
in, uh, in the babies program and in other programs also with underwear. Uh, also, we find another problem visiting the tents and having meeting with the women. Education for their kids. Yes, there is schools in Lebanon. Uh, there is schools. And the Syrians are welcome to go to the schools, that, to the government schools in Lebanon in the afternoon. Not with the Lebanese. They have special program in the afternoon. But what about the kids who were born in Syria, in Lebanon, sorry, who were born in Syria, in Lebanon, born in Lebanon? They have no Syrian identification. And they have no paper to show to the school to register. And they cannot be registered in Lebanon because they are originally Syrian. And they cannot go back to Syria because, you know, the man or escaped the army or he was from ISIS group who, who are not welcome in Syria anymore or who, who have some, some kind of problems. So what, what, what about these kids? We started education department for them. We, we have now 120 child that we are teaching in our two sites. Uh, teaching them from kindergarten to grade three. But our plan with the new land we bought is to continue for grade five, at least. And then educate them in another area, which is the vocation student. Or they, the girls will go to the, the different kind of vocation for girls and the boys to different kind of vocation for boys. Uh, okay, so here we are. After we educate the, after we educate the kids, and they are teenage now, uh, we have programs for teenage girls and teenage boys, which is the vocational training. For girls, we have like this one is netting, you know, cross stitch, uh, making pillows, or um, this is very handmade and it's very cheap for us because we only need threads and needles and uh, fabrics there is no machines there is no you know uh, we can do it easily so now we have a group of this uh, of this uh, cross stitch gears and this is on the top is the beauty salon we we teach them how to cut the hairs and makeup and you know nails and all this beauty that the ladies like to do and we have the sewing school there, uh, so we, we produce so many uh, 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 beautiful uh, stuff for, for, for um, I want to show you some of our products uh, from the sewing school. <coughs> for example, these days we are producing these books for kindergarten. Oh. It's a puzzle for like this, they can remove this and just re-put it. It's a fabric book. Yeah and uh, they can move, they can learn, it's an educational book. They can learn how to, how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, how to count from one to 10 or how to uh, add and uh, like that. And there's pockets here, they can hide their things and they can put it back here. So it's, it's for, it's for, and they can open their eyes and close the eyes and play games here. So it's, it's an educational book. For, uh, for kin and this is Christmas uh, decoration. This book for girl, for girls, and I, I want to give it to uh, who has a baby. What is she? Ah, yes, this is for your baby. Yeah. You can take it later. <laughs> and uh, something else we, we we are doing is like this runner for Christmas. We have Christmas bazaars in Lebanon where we where we sell these products and not only in Lebanon, now in Lebanon they cannot buy, they cannot afford anymore. But around the world we sell this, but the, the money we get does not go to TFI. It goes to the one who made this, the woman who made this. So uh, then she would feel like she achieved something. And uh, before we came, we had the exhibition for the graduates and they worked on all this, uh, all, all this stuff there and I gave them uh, money to each one to be, uh, as, as, a, as a pay for their work. 
with the machine. We give them also sewing machine when they graduate so they can start a job somewhere. So this kind, and also we do other things, you know, we do so many things which is very advanced and very nice and they love it and they love their work. And actually, when, when, we, when they graduate, they cry, not of joy of leaving, but they cry because they are sad of yeah. leaving. They don't want to leave. Because in this, in this uh, room, in this container where they gather every day, we, we discuss our problems, we share our thoughts, we pray together, we have friendship with them, we have chapel to them, we talk about the Lord, we, we, we show them the love of, of our, our master. And they get in love with this place. They just love to come every day and hear a few words about Jesus and cry and pray. Each one will tell me the dream. She saw Jesus covering her with blankets, she said. Why the Lord is covering me with blankets? I told her because he's telling you, whenever you are leaving after you graduate, he's not going to leave you. You are under his blanket. So trust him. Um, so yes, this, this kind of, of, uh, of um, uh, growing relationship with them, it makes their faith true and deep. It's not something like we preach 400 women and 200 came to the Lord and they rose their hands and they become Christian. That's not what we do. And I don't believe in this actually. I believe that building friendship with them by, by offering this kind of vocation, it makes them a true believer. Because they see every day Jesus in me, talking in me, and living in me. And at the end, I don't want anyone to become a Christian. That's not my mission. And that's not your mission. We want everyone to meet Jesus, and not to become a Christian because they can stay Muslims and they can stay covered without and, and, and have the faith. You know, one of my staff, she's a teacher. She came to the Lord and she's still covering. She's still wearing the hijab. In our staff meeting in June, uh, I have nine staff from a Muslim background, you know, who cover and they are from uh, teachers, but they know the Lord. She was sharing her experience and she said, you know, you see me wearing hijab. I'm not wearing hijab because I believe in it or I like it. I'm wearing hijab because this is the price I am paying to be a Christian. Because she said, my family said, I am, really, I, um, I am free to believe in Christ and to, to be a Christian if I keep my hijab. So why not? I will keep my hijab. Jesus deserved much more than that. She said, the nuns, they wear hijab. <laughs> so I will be like the nun. It doesn't mean if I am wearing hijab that I am a Muslim. Another one, Huwaida, you know Huwaida, uh, she's, she knows, uh, um, she said, the best verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God loved so much. And she said, here with, in, in this place, I experienced what it means that God loved me that much. So he died for me. That was what they shared in the staff, in the staff meetings. So this kind of ministry, it didn't come, or this kind of faith, it didn't come just in a flash. It came because they worked with us for years, and they lived with us for years, and they met, and they saw us when we are angry, and they saw us when we are sad, and they, they saw us when we are in need, and they saw how much we pay from ourselves. That's why they have a strong faith. Okay, we will move to 
This is the vocation for women. Here we have the vocation for boys. And I'm sure you saw this. Because Jack brought some of these to him last time. Didn't you? I did. So I brought each one. I hope these are enough for everyone. Each one is a cedar tree made by our boys. And there is a story for the boy written in this paper. Mm -hmm. So you, you, everyone, I don't know how many we have maybe, but you can take one and read the story and see what kind of, of, of boys and girls. The girls painted this, you know, decorate this, and the boys work very hard with their hand. There's no machine involved in here or here. This cross, it says Litakon Mashi Atak in Arabic means your will will be done. It's part of, mm -hmm. of the of the Lord's, pra Lord's prayer. prayer. Mm -hmm. So this is in Arabic Litakon Mashi Atak. So of course the girls will paint this and decorate this and the boys will work handy with the with the with the knife to do this. So we have carpentry workshop for boys. And this is really growing so fast. Uh, we have we we have a guest who came uh, on May. Uh, she paid a thousand five hundred just buying this stuff from the boys, and we gave the money to the boys, and they were so excited because they work for the whole month in Lebanon to get guess how much fifty pence. Half a dollar for the whole month. So giving them ten dollars for this, it's a feast. Yeah. They can support the family, and they can, you know, do a lot with this. So this is the vocation for boys. For boys, we have uh, we have a coach who teach them basketball mm -hmm. and uh, basketball yard. And we have another uh, co uh, playground now, which for the football, for the soccer. So we have this one in the other center, because we have two centers now. And this is the football yard. We have computer skills. We have special teacher for computers. He, te he teach them computer, carpentry. And we have also entertaining, entertaining boys club. They come to the club. They watch movie together. Of course, the movie should be, you know, a decent movie. <laughs> and uh, they play games, and they have lunch, they have food, and uh, they go home. And they, uh, and if they want, if we force them to go home. They don't want to go home. This is their place now. Okay, we move to our medical and dental care. And our sites also, we have two clinics. We have one for, we have full-time doctor uh, for uh, medical, uh, ge uh, general medical. He's a Lebanese, he's licensed from Lebanon, so he can, he can give prescription, 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 yeah? Prescription. Uh, well, please, uh, Drugs. Forgive my English. Prescription. Drugs. Yeah, and also, <laughs> and also, uh, this this let uh, this allow our our uh, our together for the family institution to be legal <coughs> in their medi medical training <coughs> or uh, treatment. We have also dental clinic, and this also he's Somar is Dr. Somar is a full time medical. Uh, Medicine, uh, dental, dentist with us. He's Syrian, uh, refugees also in Lebanon, but uh, he's a good Christian man, married to a Lebanese and have a great family. So we are very blessed to have these doctors with us. We also, we don't also bring uh, sick people to the clinic, but also we pay for surgeries like this. This uh, boy who has this, he was born like that. We paid for a surgery for a girl, little girl, she was, she was, um, only a half, one and a half year, but she passed away. She had heart problem, but we did our best to rescue her, but the Lord chose to take her. So we have uh, too much to do in that area, especially now in Lebanon, because 
There is no medicines, as you hear. I don't know if Paul told you what's, how, what's happening in Lebanon. Everybody's know maybe by now. There's no fuel, there's no electricity. Hospitals are shut down because the, most of the nurses, they left, the doctors left. Uh, there is no electricity to function. And there is no fuel in the, in the hospital. There's no medicine. So it's so scary to live in Lebanon now if you are sick. <coughs> Me and Riyadh have an emergency plan. If we got very sick and we needed hospital, we should fly to Jordan mm -hmm. as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing we can do in Lebanon now. There's no treatment in Lebanon. And pray, please pray for that situation. So maybe the Lord will do something with the new government we have. Okay, okay, feed me. This is the kids. The kids, they come to our sites to eat. They need food and so we have two cooks and they, we, we provide meals for 200 child every day in the two sites. They just come, our education also, our education uh, program, because we have kids in the school, we, we feed them lunch and also we feed the other uh, students who are coming from the community. And this has been very important program during the uh, collapse collapsing that is happening in Lebanon because at least we make sure they are eating one healthy hot meal a day uh, as much as we can you know we, we, we cannot afford always but whenever we can afford we do this for the kids okay this is the this is one of my paintings it's mm -hmm. not the colors is not clear with the projector but I put this in the presentation just to thank you, especially for helping renovating houses in Beirut during the explosion. You know the explosion happened 4th of, uh, of uh, August. August last year. Uh, we, as together for the family, went to Beirut and we uh, renovated 44 houses and three churches and one school. And I painted this because when we, were, when we were walking in the streets in, in, uh, in uh, Merim Khail uh, uh, streets in, in Beirut, I saw this little kid selling bread. So I told him, you are too young to go in this, you know, in this mass, you know, there is the collapsing and there is buildings on the street, classes everywhere, the street is dangerous, you, nobody knows when the building will fall down. Uh, the area is not secured. Why don't you go home? She said, how can I go home? My father was hit in the port and he's traumatized now. He's, he lost his mind totally. Mm -hmm. And I have five brothers and sisters and I am the older. Mm -hmm. He's 10 years. Mm -hmm. So this, these are my responsibility. <coughs> but <laughs> what touched me with this boy that he has the flag of Lebanon rise, you know. Mm -hmm. He, he didn't give up. He still has faith in Lebanon. And he believed that Lebanon will go back to its normal life one day. So that, that was, uh, you know, all these damage around. And we were cleaning the roads and cleaning the glasses with our team. And he was selling bread. And we were distributing also food baskets in, in Beirut area. And that's in that time. Okay, this is my my um, um, presentation. But there is also five minutes to talk about our new plans. What we are doing next? Why we bought a land? We bought a land uh, one hectare, hectare, acre, acre, acre. One acre. One, which is for us. Five, five times the land we have now, that we rented now. And why we bought it? Because now the prices in Lebanon are getting very low if you have cash. Yeah. If, we, if you pay cash, you pay um, only 20% of the price, mm -hmm. the original price. Yeah. So we, we saw a land, it was 370,000 US dollar. We got it for 1,010. The, 1,010, not 1,000, 100,010 dollars, which is uh, 
very, very cheap. And uh, it is the time to buy. So what happened? I was sitting with my friend in our home. She's a, she's a doctor who lives in Hawaii. And she runs an organization called Go Hawaii. She was visiting us. She wasn't one of our main donors. She was just a friend visiting. And then she told me, Izdihar, what's in your mind? What is your dream? I told her, look, Shari, my dream is to buy a land. And now it is the time to buy the land. But I cannot afford it. It is too expensive for us. If we pay the whole money we get uh, for TFF, we cannot afford to buy the land. She said, so what is your plan? I said, me and Riyadh, as a person, as a family, we will put 25,000 to us dollar because we saved this amount during the collapse, collapse time. Because you know we got dollars, mm -hmm. not like Lebanese. Our salary is it comes to Lebanon and we uh, to America and we get <laughs> we get dollars. So it is it, for us Lebanon became cheaper. Yeah, actually. So we saved this amount in the past three years. I want to put this amount as a down payment, uh, as a paid for the land. But I need to raise another uh, hundred, because we, at that time the land was 150,000, the one I sold, not this one, one before. So then she said, okay, okay, that's easy. I can raise uh, 50,000 for you. And you have 25,000, no, this is 75. We can start from here and just ask your donors if they can help. I, I sent you the appeals, you remember? You got the appeals that we want to buy land and you, you sent some uh, amount. But what happened? This Sharon, when she went back to Hawaii, her, uh, her sister died suddenly. Her name was Sharon, her sister. And her sister gave all her organs to, the, to donate it to the, to the sick people. And she was in love with this human, uh, humanistic, uh, human uh, work. So Sharon, Dr. Sharon and her father announced in her funeral that uh, if you love Cheryl, if you want her soul to be rest and peace, please donate to Together for the Family because they are planning to buy land. And we will call this land the Family Oasis, where all the family will come and have a, you know, have a, a place where they can uh, be secure and comfort and like that. And we were surprised that she raised $130,000 for this project. And that was really a miracle. It was a miracle for me. Because in no time, just the Lord, here is the heart your dream, okay. That's a piece of cake for me. Don't worry. Just go ahead and do whatever in your mind. And now they are start, they are working in the new land and they are preparing it for to move all the two centers there and have more places for kids to to enjoy bigger school. We will we will also have a new vocation for girls, which is nursing, health education, and we will have a new vocation for boys, which is car mechanics, in this new place. So praise the Lord for His work. And I praise the Lord for you, because you are part of this. You are helping us a lot while you are here. Yesterday, when uh, she told me, whenever she breastfeed her baby, she pray for our babies. Aww. For me, this is much, much, much more than money. Much more than money. I just love it. Because we depend on your prayers. The Lord is too generous, and he's very rich. He can bring money from anywhere. But that's really so silly for him. <laughs> but we, we need to feel that we are one body. This feeling, we need to feel in Lebanon that there is some people who are related to us in Christ, who are part of us, are praying, are feeling with us. And the Lord will do the rest. 